You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have and will follow up on questions they do not have the opportunity to address. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time. This email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to, to introduce today's presenter. Barbara Connell is the Vice President of Clinical Services at Medline Industries in Mundelein, Illinois. She earned her master's degree in healthcare administration from the University of St. Francis in Joliet, Illinois, and has a Bachelor of Science degree in medical technology from Creighton University. She has over 20 years of experience as a medical technologist, working at various levels of the lab, specifically in the areas of microbiology, infectious diseases, and hematology. She has 15 years experience in the IVD laboratory, laboratory diagnostics business, where she focused her love of science on new product development, execution of scientific studies, customer education, and development of key opinion leaders. As VP of Clinical Services, Barb is responsible for the development and execution of Benlight's infection prevention program. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Barbara to begin today's presentation. Thank you so much, Carrie, for that nice uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. Well, um, I hope everybody's having a, a good day today. And let's go to the next slide so we can get started. We have a lot of information to go over today. Next slide. OK, so our objectives for today's presentation are First, we're going to discuss multiple drug-resistant organisms, including CRE, and talk a little bit about their current epidemiology so you know some more about those organisms. And then we'll talk about at least three key interventions that are designed to help stop the transmission of MDROs. We're also going to talk just a little bit about the structure, functionality, and surgical use of endoscopes as they relate to um, the transmission of these MDROs. Because I'm sure that you all have a much better um, understanding of how these instruments uh, work uh, medically. And then lastly, we're going to outline the current FDA and manufacturer's recommendations for the appropriate care and handling of flexible endoscopy scopes. Next slide. OK, so this is a picture of Alexander Fleming. And if you don't know, Alexander Fleming was um, invented penicillin. And in 1945, um, Alexander Fleming said, penicillin should only be used if there is a properly diagnosed reason. And if need be, and if it needs to be used, use the highest dose possible for the shortest time necessary. Otherwise, antibiotic resistance will develop. And that was in 1945. And it was really kind of interesting that really, at that time, Alexander Fleming was really foreshadowing the future. Because if we fast forward about 70 years, next slide, this is what we have today, superbug outbreaks. And uh, watch out. And if you have any interest in the news at all and have been watching the headlights, head, headlines, sorry, um, I'm sure that you've seen uh, many of these. Superbugs outbreak at California Hospital, more than 160 exposed. Watch out for endoscopes linked to superbugs. Two more hospitals report superbugs on endoscopes. And so the fact of the matter is that we really didn't heed Alexander Fleming's words. And now today, we do have a number of organisms that are uh, resistant to multiple drugs. The other thing, too, that is happening in today's world is, of course, we're so connected via the media uh, by so many different outlets that um, these headlines often break very, very quickly. And depending on what else is going on in the world, these may be right at the top and on the Today Show when you're drinking your morning coffee. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about what exactly are superbugs. Well, superbugs are strains of bacteria that are resistant to several types of antibiotics. And obviously, that's why they're called multiple drug resistant um, organisms, or MDROs. And really what happens is these organisms 
they acquire the ability to destroy the antibiotic in order to protect themselves. And the way that they do that is that they develop genes to make them resistant to the antibiotic. And they also can develop genetic mutations that enable a bacteria to produce enzymes that inactivate antibiotics. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those enzymes uh, a little bit further into the presentation. The other thing that these organisms can do is they can also develop mutations that will eliminate the target the antibiotic is supposed to attack. So in essence, these superbugs become bigger and kind of outsmart um, that antibiotic. Next slide. Okay, so um, multiple drug resistant organisms. Isms. We talked about the fact that they acquire the ability to resist treatment against more than one antibiotic. And the, the reason why infections um, caused by MDROs are important is because number one, they're more difficult to treat because they require more toxic antibiotics. They often cause results in, um, they often result in poor patient outcomes. And of course they cost more because these patients need additional uh, stays in the hospital and uh, additional treatment so that they can recover from these organisms. Now one thing that, that you all need to be uh, concerned about um, the MDROs because I'm sure many of you are saying, well, you know what, these are really organisms that um, are an acute care problem. We don't really have too much to do with them in the ambulatory surgery center or in long-term care uh, facilities or even in physician offices. But the fact of the matter is, is that MDROs are, really, are readily transmitted um, across the continuum of the healthcare settings. And for that reason, everybody really needs to be on the alert and to be practicing infection prevention initiatives to uh, 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 delay the transmission of these particular antibiotics. Next slide. So we're going to talk just uh, a little bit about some of the multiple uh, drug-resistant organisms that there are. And this is a nice list of all of them. And the first one there that you see on the list is, of course, MRSA. And this is kind of a, um, a little story that I like to tell. Uh, when I was a very, very young girl working at my first job in microbiology, and this was back in the, in the early 80s at the University of Iowa's hospitals and clinics, when we discovered a, a, a methicillin-resistant staph aureus, that was a big deal. We sounded the alarms, everybody came, they looked, are you sure? Sometimes they made us do it over again because that was not the norm. You never saw methicillin-resistant staph. Whereas today, that's more the norm than not. Most of the uh, staph aureuses are methicillin-resistant. So, you know, it's come even in these last, you know, 30 years or so, we've seen much more uh, resistance arise. And once again, too, talking about the continuum of care, back in the 80s, um, MRSA was really an acute care problem. I mean, it was, a, it was an organism that you watched out for as a hospital-acquired infection, whereas now today, this is very readily um, um, transmissible in the community, and it's out there, and so we have to uh, be diligent about uh, that particular organism. We have uh, VRE, which is our vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. And then the next one on the list, the ESBL. Now that particular one is an extended spectrum beta-lactamase. And basically what that's saying is that organisms that are ESBL, or extended, beta, uh, extended spectrum beta-lactamase organisms, these are usually gram-negative rods they are producing the enzyme beta-lactamase, and that enzyme mediates resistance to the extended spectrum third-generation cephalosporins. So ceftazidine, ceftaxime, ceftriaxime, and the monobactams. And so when you have E. coli that are ESBL, then they are producing this beta-lactamase enzyme that are essentially making these third-generation cephalosporins ineffective. 
and makes them multiple drug resistant organisms. So like the ESBLs, we also have CRE. And CRE stands for carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae. And we're going to be talking more in detail about that in just a moment. We also have Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And once again, back in the early um, 80s, Pseudomonas, you did not find many um, multiple drug resistant Pseudomonas species back then. If you did, they were in patients who had cystic fibrosis or in burn patients who were on uh, very extended lengths of anti antibiotic treatment. Now we're starting to see um, drug resistance in Clostridium difficile. And just, just kind of an interesting uh, tidbit on Clostridium difficile that I discovered uh, as I was researching a presentation for that particular organism. So Clostridium in Latin means spindle. And if you've ever seen that organism under a gram stain, you'd see that it's got the two little spores on the end and then it's kind of clear in the middle. So it looks like a spindle. And then difficile actually means difficult. So um, they really named that organism appropriately. That doesn't happen uh, that often. Um, Neisseria gonorrhea, once again, this was an organism that easily was treated by penicillin uh, a number of years ago. And today we're starting to see more and more multiple drug resistant strains in Neisseria gonorrhea. And lastly, tuberculosis. That's another multiple drug resistant organism. And in fact, um, I'm sure you saw it in the news in the last couple of weeks. They were treating a woman who had come from India and um, at the NIH for a very, very resistant strain of tuberculosis. And in fact, she was here in uh, the area where I live, a couple miles north, in her travels across the Midwest before they discovered that she had that organism. Next slide, please. I'm sure, so what exactly causes resistance? And I kind of like this little cartoon here. It says, if you can't see it very well, it was on a shortcut through the hospital kitchen that Albert was first approached by a member of the antibiotic resistance. Hey kid, want to be a super bug? Stick some of this into your genome. Even penicillin won't be able to harm you. So it's kind of funny, but it's really not. Next slide. So some of the things that really have caused antibiotic resistance, as you can imagine, one of the first things is overuse of antibiotics. In humans, we know that we are a culture of pill takers. We like to take pills. We believe that uh, pills in medicine will help us to solve um, all of our woes. And so we're very demanding on our physicians. And even if it's not in the best interest of the particular ailment that we have, we often badger our physicians into providing us with antibiotics or other kind of medicines. And so, you know, that has become a real problem. I think in recent years with antibiotic stewardship, it's, um, it's lessening a little bit, but there's still a long way to go. The other overuse of antibiotics is seen in animals. And I'm not sure if you know this, but about 80% of all any antibiotics that are manufactured are actually given to our beef cattle, our hogs, and our um, chickens um, to promote growth. And these uh, animals will take these antibiotics, but unfortunately, they don't degrade the antibiotic totally. And so they'll excrete them into the environment. And then we have antibiotics in our land and in our water systems and also in um, the, the meat that we eat. And so in that way, too, those uh, resistant organisms can overwhelm and it promotes antibiotic resistance. Another way that uh, causes antibiotic resistance is the inappropriate use of antibiotics. Now, I'm sure nobody's going to admit this, but I know that we all do it. We hoard pills. So you may be given a prescription by your physician and um, you're starting to take it, and maybe after five or six days, you decide, you know what, I'm, I'm really better, and maybe you miss a couple of doses, and maybe you miss a couple of more, and then you're like, oh, I, I'm better, and you don't finish taking that prescription at all. Well, 
most of us do not throw the rest of those pills away and we put them in our medicine cabinet and there they sit until sometimes another member of our family may come up with the same ailment and we might say well you know what the doctor gave me these to take here you go and then you know we have um, uh, antibiotics once again inappropriately being used Another statistics that, that I found too was that 30 to 50 percent of all antibiotics that are prescribed are prescribed inappropriately. So once again, I think that um, actually comes from uh, consumer demand for pills. But the other thing too is when they talk about inappropriate prescription of antibiotics, that's also looking at an infection and before the physician receives the antibiogram that tells them what that organism is resistant to and sensitive to, they'll prescribe a broad spectrum antibiotic that basically will kill everything instead of one that is very targeted because they don't know yet. Next slide. So what are the consequences of these resistant organisms? Well, number one, we have the emergence of strains that are totally resistant to all available antimicrobials. And that causes increased morbidity and mortality because if you don't have a medicine that can, you know, help these organisms or that can kill these organisms, there's not much else you can do. Like we said earlier, it can increase the length of stay and readmission. And once again, the consequences of these things are really going to have to change the approach to the administration of empiric antimicrobial therapy and actually antimicrobial stewardship too. So like I said just a minute ago, instead of prescribing that broad spectrum antibiotic, um, you look for a more targeted antibiotic if you can or you shorten the length of time that you're uh, administering that broad spectrum antibiotic. Next slide. So what's the economic impact of uh, resistant organisms? Well, over 400,000 hospital-acquired infections annually are caused by MDROs, and their estimated cost is almost $4.5 billion. There's 23,000 deaths annually from resistant organisms, and surprisingly, maybe not, it's the 11th leading cause um, of death. Next slide. So now we're going to start to talk a little bit about CRE. Next slide. So, yay, we get to talk a little more about microbiology. I'm sure, I'm sure you're all thrilled about that out there. So, a little lesson here. Enterobacteriaceae are a family of bacteria. And in that family of bacteria, there are over 70 species. And some of those species are Klebsiella species. And you probably know especially Klebsiella pneumoniae, E. coli, there's Enterobacter, there's Acinetobacter, there's Shigella, Salmonella, and I can go on and on about the different Enterobacteriaceae species that there are. Now, CRE refers to carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae. And carbapenem, I'm sure you all know, are a class of antibiotics, and they're actually the last line of treatment for infections caused by resistant gram-negative bacilli. So that's, so that's really important to know. And examples of those organisms, or um, examples of those antibiotics are imipenem, meropenem, and doropenem. And um, carb um, carbapenemase is the enzyme that confers resistance to carbapenems. So if you're getting the drift here, CRE are Enterobacteriaceae organisms that have the gene or that mutate that gene to produce carbapenemase that render the class of antibiotics, the carbapenem class of antibiotics, ineffective. They're resistant to them. Next slide. So what are some of the risk factors for acquiring CRE? Well, um, persons at risk are those people who are receiving serious medical care. So if you're receiving serious medical care, uh, you may have invasive uh, medical devices, uh, Foley catheters, CVC lines, you may have open wounds. 
These are generally also people who are taking long courses of certain antibiotics. And, you know, as I'm looking at the presentations, really taking long courses of certain antibiotics probably should be the first bullet point. So taking long courses of um, certain antibiotics and then receiving the serious um, medical care with these devices. Immunocompromised people and elderly people too. These are really the people who are at risk of acquiring CRE. Another thing that we really have to uh, think about too is one of the biggest risk factors is recent, within about the last six months, of exposure to hospitalization in a country outside the U.S. CRE is very prevalent in India and in other parts of the world. So when you look on the APEC um, you know, discussion boards or whatever, there are all these questions out there that are asking, do we still have to ask the travel questions about Ebola? Well, the answer is, Yes, you have to ask travel questions when you're bringing patients into your facility. So in your registration process or in your admitting process, it's very important to ask patients if they have traveled outside of the U.S. within the last six months because that could really give you an indication that they may um, you know, either be bringing these organisms in or at least have a risk to acquiring these organisms. And so I think for ASCs and physicians' offices, these are that's a really, really important question to ask. Now, many of you are probably sitting there and you're saying, well, you know what, Barb, we really don't see uh, a lot of these, you know, uh, seriously ill, you know, patients in our facilities, you know, they're, they're taken care of in the acute care area. And, uh, but you will get patients who are taking long courses of certain antibiotics. And the, and the fact of the matter is you will see patients that you don't even know who are colonized with these infections. So they may not have active infection anymore, but they still have um, these multiple drug resistant uh, organisms, CRE, within their bodies. They're colonized. They can transmit these organisms. They're just not active. Next slide. So how common are CRE? Well, this is some information that was submitted to the National Health Safety Network, the NHSN. And basically, the percent of Enterobacteriaceae that are uh, n not um, susceptible or resistant to carbapenem increased from 1.2% to 4.2% from 2001 to 2011. And the percent of uh, carbapenem resistant Klebsiella increased from 1.6 to 10.4% uh, uh, during that time period, too. And what's really, really interesting about these facts is that during that, in 2012, for those facilities that were reporting CAUTI or CLAPSI uh, to the NHSN in the acute care setting, 4.6 acute care settings in 2012 reported at least one CAUTI or CLAPSI caused by CRE. 3.9, short stay acute care, and 17.8 in your LTACs. So these organisms are out, are out there. Next slide. So when we look at CRE versus other MDROs, uh, CRA is about 3.08 per 100,000 population, whereas MRSA is really about 25.1 per 100,000 population. And our good friend uh, Clostridium difficile is 147.3 per 100,000 population. So it's not as, uh, as prevalent as some of the other multiple drug resistant organisms but it doesn't take long. And in this um, little cartoon here, you see the boss man sitting there and he's like, I'm not blind. If antibiotic resistant were a big issue, I would have seen it by now. Well, just as Alexander Fleming said, be on the lookout. We certainly weren't looking out for it. And it's coming. We just now have to make sure that we're cognizant of it and we try to take steps to stop it. Next slide. 
this is a, um, a picture here, and this is a, a prevalence slide too that was um, put out by the CDC and the references down there at the bottom if you wanted to go ahead and take a look at it. And this was last updated in February in 2015. And in this particular slide, all the states that are in blue, these are all states that have reported and have had confirmed CRE organisms um, by the CDC. So there's only two states in the uh, 50 United States that have not had or did not have any CRE uh, confirmed cases um, it, uh, as of February 2015, and that was Idaho and that was Maine. Now, if you're very concerned about these, I really wouldn't consider moving to those states because more than likely the CRE from Washington, Oregon, Montana, and Wyoming will find their way to Idaho, as will the New Hampshire Cree will creep into Maine. So I'm sure that the statistics may show all 50 states blue by now. Next slide. So is Cree really just another type of MDRO? What makes it really special? Well, special not in a good way. Number one, there's no decolonization strategy. So unlike MRSA, where we do, you know, we can use um, uh, mucipren or vancomycin uh, to decolonize these patients, there's no strategy for CRE. There's really few treatment options available uh, when these patients do acquire this. And once again, the patients who are most susceptible to these um, infections are really very sick anyway. So on top of this organism, it's, um, the mortality rate is very, very high, 50% in some studies. And once again, these, uh, this resistance, it likes to hop between many of the Enterobacteriaceae. So these organisms love to share, and they share at a high rate of speed and a high, um, a high rate of transfer to each other. So once again, we have to keep our eye on them. Next slide. So what can we do as far as infection prevention? Well, you can see the list of items, your core measures, and these are the things that really need to be instituted. And um, on the other side are additional measures that may be uh, helpful for infection prevention. Next slide. But for the ASC or the physician office laboratory, the things that are highlighted in red are really the things that, um, uh, that concern you the most. Hand hygiene, of course. We really need the hand hygiene contact precautions. Um, actually, in cases where you would uh, discover that you know they, the person had uh, a Cree infection at one time or whatever, you might consider using contact precautions. But certainly, you're using standard precautions in all of your uh, cases. Another really important thing is healthcare education, and I'm really pleased to see all the folks that have come out today to um, learn about this because we really need to educate our uh, healthcare workers on the dangers of these organisms and how we really can uh, prevent these. Um, antimi antimicrobial stewardship is a big thing that certainly has to take place across the continuum of healthcare. And another thing that's very, very important too is interfacility communication. And, you know, so even from the physician's office to the ASC or from the um, long-term care facility or the nursing home or assisted living facility to the ASC or to the physician's office, it's very, very important that these types of infections or risk factors be communicated to the receiving entity as well as the information being given, you know, from the, um, from the place where these patients are coming from. Next slide. So now we're going to talk, we're going to start to talk about the endoscope. So everybody's saying, yay, she's done talking about microbiology. Okay, next slide. So another a little bit of history about endoscopes. Um, I always like to start with that so you get a little perspective. Um, in 1806, the first endoscope was developed by Philip Lanzini in Germany. 
The first endoscope that was ever introduced into a human was by William Beaumont in 1822. And around 1911, George Wolfe produced the Sussman Flexible Gastroscope. 1963 to 64, Fernando Alves Martins of Portugal invented the first fiber optic endoscope. And in 2002, there was the unveiling of the world's first endoscope, um, endoscope system uh, based on HDTV. And I'm sure we all are so thrilled that we can now see um, our colons at, um, via HDTV. And actually, it's a very, it's a, it's a very good thing. Next slide. As we, you know, as we really talk uh, about the uh, technology that has developed with these endoscopes, I can assure you that there have probably been more uh, developments since 2002. But as we make our way into the years ahead, you're going to be seeing a lot of other um, changes. So types of endoscopes. We obviously have our rigid endoscopes and we have our uh, flexible endoscopes. And the only reason that I really bring up rigid endoscopes today is um, just briefly because of the fact that they are not immune to contamination by these types of organisms. So really, any type of complicated instrument that's inserted into our bodies, we really need to make sure that um, we're pro providing the appropriate cleaning and such. So um, although there have been more outbreaks associated with the flexible endoscopes, number one, um, because of their complex um, mechanisms inside them, the elevator mechanisms, and also because of the long tubing that's used, Remember that those rigid scopes, you know, are not immune. Next slide. So back in May, I attended the um, the Shea. Oh, here. Okay. So you know, we were talking earlier about how the media um, brings up these um, these outbreaks so quickly and everything like that. Well, this was just another article that was um, printed in Outpatient Surgery the first week of June, so just a couple weeks ago. And this was talking about an expert panel. Expert panel says, duodenoscope design isn't safe. And actually what this article is talking about is there was a meeting that the FDA called in the middle of May. And in this meeting, they brought um, together uh, folks from the FDA, consumer uh, uh, representatives, doctors, health experts, and device manufacturers. And they all kind of gathered together and they were trying to decide, well, what are we going to do? What are our next steps going to be um, about this problem? Because now they're, they're deciding to... Um, you know, take some action on this. And basically what this panel um, concluded at this particular time was that um, the FDA agreed that banning the scopes would really do more harm than good, but we're really not doing enough to eliminate the threat. And I, I think that we probably all knew that. So. They're trying to outline some additional steps that they're going to be taking or, or recommendations that they're going to be uh, giving uh, for us to follow. So next slide. So at the same time that this panel was um, meeting, the SHEA meeting was going on, and that's the Society for Healthcare um, Epidemiology. And at, and at this meeting, Dr. Alex Callen from the CDC he gave uh, a nice presentation on uh, you know, what we should be doing with uh, these duodenum scopes and uh, how we should be handling these outbreaks. And this was a list of uh, clusters of contaminated scopes from July of 2013 until March of 2015. And when you look at this particular list, you can see that there really wasn't any manufacturer that was uh, spared an outbreak. So this is not one particular manufacturer or, or another that um, this problem is occurring in. And the fact that you know Olympus has a few more outbreaks than the other manufacturers, I think is really just um, a matter of the fact that uh, Olympus may have more market share than the other endoscope uh, manufacturers do. So we're not 
uh, picking on Olympus by, by any means. Now when you look at the organisms that have caused these outbreaks, when you look down the line, all of those organisms except the outbreak, the very last outbreak in March of 2015, all of the other outbreaks were caused by CREs or carbapenemase resistant enterobacteriaceae. That last outbreak was actually produced by our extended uh, spectrum beta-lactamase producing E. coli. So all of these multiple drug resistant organisms would like to get into the act. So we have to remember that uh, CRE is not the only organism that can contaminate your scopes. Next slide. So what are some of the um, causes of these outbreaks? And this was an article, this was really interesting too, because this was an article that was published way back in gastrointestinal endoscopy back in 2003 by Nelson. And I found this article and I looked through it and I looked through all the causes that they outlined and it really paralleled, it still paralleled what is happening today. So nothing has really changed, you know, in the last 13 years or so. But one of the biggest things that causes these outbreaks is not following the recommended cleaning or disinfection steps um, with these scopes. Skip steps or improperly executing some, uh, some, ste some steps, uh, including insufficient manual cleaning. And we'll talk a little bit later about some uh, cleaning tips for manual cleaning. But um, one of the biggest things is that if these scopes are not cleaned immediately after use at the bedside or aren't soaked in an appropriate disinfectant um, you know, until someone can get to manually cleaning them, they won't be disinfected. You have to clean before you disinfect. Another interesting cause of the outbreaks too was use of substandard disinfectant or inefficient exposure um, of the disinfectant to the endoscope. So uh, failure to maintain proper concentrations, so maybe you're using a disinfectant that needs to be prepared, uh, maybe it's not being prepared correctly. Using expired chemicals, um, we should never ever use expired chemicals. I don't care if you have 10 gallons of a certain disinfectant, if it's expired, you may use uh, expired Lysol at home, but if you've got expired disinfectant reagents, uh, chemicals in your facility, it's much less expensive to dispose of those chemicals and to avoid um, an, uh, an outbreak of these organisms than it would be to take a chance to use those chemicals. Um, so make sure that you're following uh, how these disinfectants are uh, supposed to be used, what's outlined by their manufacturer. And when we talk about insufficient exposure of the endoscope, think about those flexible um, scopes in the long tubing that they have. Are we sure that that disinfectant is getting all the way through all that tubing and disinfecting um, all parts of that um, instrument? Contaminated water bottles and irrigating solutions. And surprisingly, this was a cause of many, um, of some of the outbreaks with the rigid scopes. And apparently some of the, um, there were facilities that were not changing or cleaning the water bottles um, between patients. So they would use one, you know, one particular bottle or irrigating solution to do one patient and then instead of changing it, they would go right back and, and use it on the next patient. But we know that even though those fluids are supposed to go one way through the tubing, sometimes you get a little backwash. And um, if you're using that same bottle uh, of water or that same bottle of solution, you could um, take the um, have the chance of, of infecting the next patient. And of course, block channels, and that obviously would come from insufficient um, manual cleaning. Next slide. Some of the other causes um, of, of uh, endoscopic outbreaks would be the improper use of an ARE. 
So the AREs are, are wonderful instruments, but if they're not operated appropriately, if it wasn't connected appropriately, that can be an issue because it's, it's not going to, um, you know, clean them properly. So, so even if you're using automated cleaning systems, you should still manual, manually clean those scopes, um, at least some, before you put them in those, um, in those processors. The other cause of outbreaks can be inadequate drying of endoscope channels. So if you leave, if fluid is left in these channels, if you don't give it that good um, rinse with you know, uh, air and, and alcohol going through it and you leave some liquid in there, that's the perfect breeding ground for Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas loves wet stuff. Improper storage of the endoscopes. There have been cases and papers have been written where there wasn't, uh, we know that your space is tight um, in your centers uh, for cleaning these scopes and there wasn't adequate space for really cleaning and, um, and, and storing the clean scopes. So in some cases there are often contaminated scopes that were very close to clean scopes or they weren't labeled appropriately so you couldn't really tell which ones were dirty and which ones were clean. So that was a problem. And then defective equipment. Not only defective equipment as far as the endoscopes go, but also the reprocessing equipment. Next slide. So, um, okay, so this is a picture of the, um, of the open and closed elevator channel. And uh, once again, we're, we're not, you know, discriminating against Olympus. This was in a paper that was published just uh, recently in endoscopy by uh, Verfali. And uh, this was a great picture on your left-hand side. This is a picture of the uh, open-wired um, elevator channel. And then on the right-hand side is a fixed distal cap and a sealed elevator channel. And they, um, they actually thought that because that wire was open, it may have been causing some problems with cleaning because maybe you couldn't, um, you know, get in there far enough or there was debris that was getting into that open channel and so they, they closed it off, but yet there's still problems with appropriately cleaning it. And a matter of factly, there are actually uh, more cases of closed, um, closed channel um, outbreaks than there are of open channel outbreaks. Next slide. So, let's see, next slide. So the CDC um, investigation findings, they, they really found that, uh, that the duodenoscopes linked to transmission were of variable ages. So they could be weeks to years old. And they've involved both open and elevator and closed elevator wire um, endoscopes, like we talked about. And um, facilities, and, and this was kind of an interesting point too. They said too that facilities often perceive problems remo removing debris with what they felt was their recommended procedures. So they started adding their own procedures. And they started using other brushes. And in fact, that ended up causing, you know, some problems. And then once again to, um, you know, facilities deviating from, um, from recommended practices, using additional brushes, and using detergents or disinfectants not on the manufacturer's list. And when they looked at these different clusters, they also found too that even after disinfecting these scopes, they still came up with cultures positive months, uh, months after use. Next slide. And this was just another article, or this was in the Barfali uh, article where it talked about another outbreak. And this one here was of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, or caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and where they found the organism was in the sink. They cultured the sink in the, in the endoscopy suite. And um, they also found um, Pseudomonas living in the elevator recess and in the distal 
tabs of that um, endoscope. Next slide. So other areas of contamination um, that there are, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, there's um, sludge that they found around those um, and around the O-rings there, brown stains, and this was after uh, uh, disinfection, cracks in the scopes. Microorganisms love those cracks. Next slide. And the next slide really was just a list of uh, some other articles that they looked at uh, where those particular uh, uh, endoscopes uh, were harboring the organisms. Next slide. And so let's talk a little bit about the reprocessing guidelines now. Next slide. And so in um, February of 2015, the, CD, uh, the FDA came out with um, their particular guidelines, and they updated again in, again in March of 2015. So if you want to see those, um, you can go to that website below. Next slide. And in their recommendations, they, it was a pretty long page of recommendations, but basically what they were saying is, and this is the whole gist of it, they said, you must closely follow all manufacturers' instructions for cleaning and processing. And you have to adhere to the process, reprocessing guidelines. You have to, um, you know, I mean, really, that's, that's what they're saying. They're saying if you uh, deviate from the instructions, it's going to contribute to contamination. And, um, and there really wasn't clear benefit of using cleaning accessories not specified by the manufacturer's instructions. And another thing that was really important that they said was, if you're having a, pro a problem cleaning your scopes, you need to report it to the FDA and to the device manufacturer, or report it to the manufacturer and then to the FDA. Because if they don't hear that you're having a problem, they're not going to do anything about it. Next slide, please. So. Um, some of the other best practices, we, you know, we talked a little bit about meticulously cleaning the elevator mechanism, uh, raising and lower, lowering that elevator throughout the manual cleaning process to allow brushing of both sides. They also talked about making sure that you have a comprehensive quality control uh, program for reprocessing. And in this quality control program, you really need to have written uh, procedures for monitoring training, adherence to programs, and documentation of equipment tests and processes. And all those guidelines, would, um, which you should have in that quality control uh, program, it, all of these can be found in the multi-society guidelines on reprocessing uh, flexible gastrointestinal endoscopes. 2011. So those guidelines are still valid. Next slide. Now, um, Olympus did um, put out a letter saying that they did validate new reprocessing instructions uh, for this particular model, and I'm, I think that the other manufacturers have said too. So it's very important that you look at the model of scopes that you have and that you check the manufacturer's websites frequently for updates in their uh, instructions on how to clean these scopes. And in fact, you should actually ask your manufacturers if maybe they can't send you some kind of email alert or something when they do um, update those instructions. Next slide. Now, the CDC, of course, they you know, need to get into the act. And they also uh, gave some recommendations. And of course, at the top of the list was um, these particular recommendations were intended to supplement and not replace or modify manufacturer's recommendations. So um, the big, you know, three is, you know, strict adherence to manufacturer's instructions. Are you tired of hearing me say that? Um, inspect and manual cleaning, making sure that you're opening and raising and lowering that um, elevator. And drying, thoroughly drying the equipment uh, by using forced air and alcohol flushes. Next slide. Now, I, I've got a couple of slides about surveillance, and it's talking about how to do surveillance. And this is all on the CDC um, website. Next slide. And they have a really nice algorithm that talks about how to do 
um, the surveillance, and that's the, um, the website that you can go to. But in the end, next slide, what they really said was that, um, you know, there are some sort of um, cautions to surveillance. And basically, this is a short-term option. It is not a regulatory requirement. So there is no requirement out there right now that, ha that says that you have to do uh, surveillance cultures on your scopes. It's not a substitute for good reprocessing practices, and it's not intended to supplant um, approved reprocessing instructions. Because they understand that this is really a challenge at many facilities, and really the sensitivity of doing these cultures is really um, unknown. Next slide. So, so in other words, surveillance, I mean, if you, if you really feel compelled to do that, um, you certainly can, but it's not a regulatory requirement. Um, so some other considerations. Next slide. One of the big things, like we talked about, is pre-cleaning these scopes. And um, we talked a little bit about these before, uh, to make sure that you know, they are uh, cleaned and adequately rinsed. At the, um, at the bedside of the patient, and you have to try to remove all the bile burden uh, that's, uh, that's left on these scopes. And if you can't pre-clean right away, make sure that you're soaking in a manufacturer's recommend, uh, recommended enzymatic detergent. Next slide. Um, you should use a parts bag for endoscope valves and other detachable equipment that can be removed. And this really prevents the internal channels from retaining any water. Like I said, that can be a reservoir. And use uh, disinfection labels so that you can keep track of the last time each scope was re, uh, reprocessed. And keep your department organized through the decam decam decontamination process. So make sure you've got decontamination uh, clearly outlined and where your clean scopes are um, on the other side. Next slide. They also talked a little bit about high level, um, a higher level of disinfection. Now um, they were talking that, you know, maybe, you know, it might be time to start using um, ETO and uh, and I know that that many of you are saying right now, oh, we can't use, you know, we can't use that because you know there are potential issues with sterilizing with ethylene oxide. Uh, number one, not all devices have been validated for use with it. There's toxicity. Of course, it takes longer processing time, and if cleaning is the problem, sterilization still isn't going to work. Um, and of course, there can be long-term consequences for the device. You know, possibly too, you could use a liquid chemical sterilization like paracetic acid, uh, but once again, the end product might, might not be sterile because rinsed water might not be sterile. Next slide. So other considerations that we need to think about is, and I, and I think this is probably the most important thing, is training for all your employees up to date. And if you're not sure, this might be one of your top things to work on in your risk assessment for your IP, um, you know, the rest of the, you know, throughout the rest of the year. Are competencies complete and any failures addressed? And the other thing, too, when you're looking at your process, you might look for things like interruptions. Are the persons who are cleaning these scopes, they're trying to do the best job that they can, but they, are they being interrupted all the time? So maybe they're, they, they don't remember where they left off. Are there time constraints? Do you need to get these scopes reprocessed very quickly so that they can be used in other cases? And do you have uh, staffing sh shortages? And if you do, then it really may be time to consider some um, interventions that can lessen the interruptions and maybe even possibly purchasing some additional scopes so that you have more scopes available for your caseload. Next slide. So some other um, considerations. The people who are cleaning your scopes really need to have a thorough understanding of the structure of the device that they're cleaning. They need to know that instrument inside and out. They have to, and, and if not everybody can do that, you need to have at least one lead who can instruct everybody else on how to do that. 
follow that manufacturer's instructions and pay very close detail when you're cleaning. And like I said, frequently um, check manufacturer's updates. Next slide. So what are some potential long-term solutions? Next slide. Well, number one, of course, what they're looking at is they're looking at uh, redesigning these scopes. Um, I, I bet you didn't see that coming. Uh, and maybe it should have happened you know, earlier, but they're looking at what can they do to uh, make cleaning these very complicated instruments much easier. Could uh, potentially be removing the distal end caps, using uh, single-use parts, new or modified reprocessing, you know, validate high-level dis disinfection uh, or a higher-level disinfection for the scope sterilization, and then to try to actually find or uh, improve ways to validate reprocessing assessment, so possibly by using ATP or other non-culture methods. And they're still looking at surveillance, but as we know, surveillance is probably not the answer to uh, uh, really validating um, the reprocessing. So next slide. So in summary, we learned some about the MDROs. We know that they um, that the infections they cause really require more expensive antibiotics and they're, they're really expensive and um, they're transmissible across the continuum uh, of all healthcare settings and they're showing up in the community. Next slide. And the, as far as the endoscopes go, we know that we need to use a basic level of infection control uh, with all patients. You know, standard precautions need to be used at least. Um, contact, you know, precautions with, with gowns and gloves. Hand hygiene for everyone, that, you know, cannot be said enough. Next slide. And, you know, for your endoscopes, follow the manufacturer's instructions. Educate your staff. Educate your staff. Have clear, defined procedures. Review your procedures and processes. You know, often meticulously clean that elevator mechanism, and implement that comprehensive quality um, control pro program for reprocessing. And then at the end here, I do have some additional resources that you can go to um, the CDC and the FDA and the multiple guideline. Uh, uh, for reprocessing uh, are all wonderful resources. The, the This Amy resource, SD, ST91, uh, is another uh, excellent resource that's often referred to uh, by the CDC and the FDA. They all have great information on what you can do um, as far as reprocessing your endoscopes. So with that, I turn it back to Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for a very informative and enjoyable presentation. We will now begin the Q&A portion of the program. As a reminder, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel on the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have for Q&A, and we'll follow up on questions they do not have the opportunity to address. Looks like we have uh, time for just about one or two questions here. Uh, first one from the audience. How long can CRE live on surfaces and fabric? Well, CRE, um, it is one of those organisms that can live, um, you know, at least for, you know, a few weeks um, or months on the, uh, on the surfaces. So once again, your EVS, your environmental cleaning is, is very, very important. Just like cleaning your instruments, washing your hands or whatever, but it's not, it doesn't live as long as C, as C. diff because C. diff produces spores and um, CRE is just, it's a gram negative, so it does, it does not live as long. I want to again thank Barbara for the excellent presentation and all of you for participating today. We look forward to having you join us for future webinars. This concludes today's program.